One of the hardest questions to answer with comics is a very basic one. Where do I begin? With so many endless series and years of continuity, finding a starting point can be difficult, but that's where this series comes in. Each week, I look at all the new comics to pick out ongoing series starting new arcs, notable new series, and trade paperbacks and graphic novels being released. Then I finish things up by picking out my pick of the week, the thing I'm most excited about coming out this week. All right, let's start things off by looking at all the new series coming out this week. I usually start this with whatever I think will be the biggest new number one coming out. And this week is a bit difficult. Actually, I think there's a lot of choices, but I ultimately went with Wonder Girl number one because I feel like this is a brand new character that was really kind of established this year. A lot of people are excited about this book. A lot of people did seem to really enjoy the Future State series that came out earlier in the year. And this is continuing that, although continuing that by being a prequel in a way, I'm not sure. But once again, this is written and drawn by Joelle Jones, which is why I'm really excited about it with art by Jordi Belair, who she tends to work with a lot in her career. So when they work together, magic does ensue. And Dora Flor, which is a Brazilian Wonder Woman, although we're finding out in this issue, she comes from Idaho. So this is about her journey, I guess, to become the new Wonder Woman or whatever t title they want to give her. What I really loved about the Future State book is that it had a, a nice sense of humor to it. There was some interesting story choices in a way. She ended up going into kind of this afterlife. And I don't know, I felt like it was a series that probably could have used some room to breathe. And now they're getting that opportunity where now Joel Jones and uh, Jordi Belair and the rest of the creative team are getting that opportunity to tell a more complete story. I'm guessing this is an ongoing that doesn't say it's limited series, although sometimes they can be a little bit close to the vest with that stuff, so you're never really sure. And with it being written and drawn by Joel Jones, like with Catwoman, she kind of, she was doing everything at first, but eventually she just went to writing duties. My hope is she will uh, do, the, do everything because I tend to enjoy her work the most when she's doing everything. But if they can get a competent artist to come along too, maybe it will work. But ultimately, if you love this character and we're a big fan of her earlier series, now you can check this out. Even if you have not read this, this does seem like it is you know, taking place well before the Future State book. So it doesn't necessarily matter what you read before. So it's also a great starting point if you just want to read a new DC character. A new week, another new Batman series with Legends of the Dark Knight well, number one coming out. Uh, Legend of the Dark Knight series, this was a digital first series that is now seeing a physical release. So if you want to read it digitally, you can actually do that the moment this video drops. But if you want the physical version, now it's hitting stores this week. Each issue is going to have a different writer and creator te creative team. This issue with Derek Robinson and he, of course, did great 90s series like Transcendental Palton and uh, most recently Space Bastards. He also did uh, Hellblazer Rise and Fall earlier this year. So he's a well-established writer and artist, although probably much more known for his art. So how is he as a writer? I don't know, but I, I would love to see him take on the Batman world. So that's exciting. I have not read this. I usually do read the digital first series, but this is one that I completely missed in the plethora of Batman books that are currently out with this. Batman Black and White, Blackman Urban Legends, Blackman the Detective, Bat Detective Comics, and Batman. There are a lot of Batman books. I don't think they're are going to be running low at any time soon. So now we're getting a new one to the mix. I guess the benefit of this series is that with it being a new creative team, you can kind of jump in at any point and see on, you know, maybe creators that wouldn't be able to go on long runs with the character, at least getting one shot to tell their story. So I guess that is something a little bit different. Uh, this, of course, seems to have a lot of iconic heroes and villains in it where, you know, Penguin, Mr. Freeze, uh, it seems like Derek Robinson's like, I'm telling my Batman story and I'm going to tell as much of my Batman story as I want to. So, you know, if you're a huge fan of his or if you do want a, a Batman book that has a little bit more variety, you can check out this book this week. Also coming out from Marvel this week, you have the Immortal Hulk, Time of Monsters, number one. And this is another one of the Immortal Hulk one-shots done by d different creative teams. This done by Alex Panadale with art by Juan Ferreira. And a big reason I'm excited for this book, I do really like this creative team. For example, this is from the writer who gave us Friendo, which is a series I do really enjoy. It's just kind of this twist, this take on uh, a future take on Wizard of Oz in a way, but not in a very obvious sense. And then... Uh, Juan Ferreira is one of my favorite artists currently right now. Uh, he's done everything from the recent uh, uh, Thunderbolts book. He also did the Killmonger book. He has a, a style that's unlike anything else, and I love his page layouts. He's got a really unique language when it comes to the comic book world, so anytime he's on a book, 
I'm picking it up and now taking them taking on the Immortal Hulk series. Which I do feel like the Immortal Hulk series, I know a lot of people have been saying this. It's uh, in a lot of reviews that it's not necessarily at the peak it once was. And maybe that's the case, but usually with Immortal Hulk, I think you still tend to get a good issue. It's not at the, the highest level of when it first started, especially because when it first started, you got more episodic stories. So things felt more complete. And now it's much more decompressed in a way. With these one shots, I feel like you get much more of what it for, used to be. I love the Jeff and Lehrer book. Uh, the one by Delkin Shelby was also fantastic. So despite the fact they're just kind of milking the name of Immortal Hulk, it's good milk. So there you go. You know, milk does the body good. And that's the case with, with these one shots. It's a really bad joke. And I do apologize. But I do think that this series is something to be excited about. So I really love this creative team. Really excited for this. I almost made this my pick of the week. This is actually a really jam-packed week. A lot of comics I'm really excited about that have a lot of potential. And this is definitely one of them. Also coming out this week from Marvel Comics, we have Shang-Chi number one, hot off the heels of the recent Shang-Chi trailer. So if you got excited for that, it's like, I want to read more Shang-Chi, and you're not sure where to start, now you have a new series. This, once again, is written by Jing Ying Lang, who did the book last year, uh, Shang-Chi. So this does seem to tie into that. Uh, so if you've not read that, you might be a little lost. I will say I did like that book. It, it was good enough, and not to dimension the shit, but I thought it was a good way of introducing the character. It did tie into his past, but as someone who is a relative novice to the character, I was able to read it and understand it, and I thought it, it did a good job of kind of expanding of who the character was and maybe making him a new status quo to kind of build on, which this issue will then continue. A big focus on that was his relationship with his sister. This now is incorporating other Marvel Universe characters are coming out and apparently trying to take Shang-Chi down because he's kind of part of this criminal underground. It's, it's hard to explain without ruining it, but I will say that that's exciting, seeing Shang-Chi tank on other Marvel characters, maybe really show what he has as a character. And I'm glad that you know people tend to have mixed reactions to the way that movies impact what goes on in the side of the books of Marvel and DC, like how they tend to write them towards the movies. Like Tony Stark feels very much like Robert Downey Jr. in some of the comics. But I think one of the benefits is when you're now getting some of these characters that have not been a mainstay in the Marvel universe for some time, now we're getting serious about them. And you know, now and maybe the, the Eternals and uh, things of that nature. So seeing more variety, allowing books like this to exist uh, and maybe be a bigger mainstay than they were few years ago so there's some positives to that how good it will be I, I don't know but I think if it's as consistent as the last series it'll be a, a fun little read a good read to kind of whet the appetite for the movie and that hopefully comes out relatively soon the last number one we're going to talk about this week is Red Room number one and I feel a little odd talking about this because I've already read it because it's already available digitally uh, I didn't realize there would be so much a difference between the digital release and the physical release so if you watch my, my, ten, my top 10 a few weeks ago. It was actually in my top 10. It was number two for that week. So I've already read it. Obviously, I liked it. Um, but now it's coming out to your local book comic book shops. And this is written and drawn by Ed Piscor. You know, of course, of the cartoonist k uh, YouTube fame and did, of course, uh, other books like uh, Hip Hop Family Tree, uh, X-Men Grand Design. And now this is a brand new book uh, based upon his own idea. It's about murder on the dark web for fun and profit. And as I said, as someone who read it, there is murder, like hardcore death murder in this. It's not for the faint of heart. It's brutal to watch uh, if you like those movies like Saw, but I think it's even more intense in a way. I feel like I don't love that torture porn as style typically when it comes to film, but for whatever reason, when it came to the comic book world, maybe just because of the stylized look of it, it doesn't necessarily feel, it's not like it's delving into realism per se. I was able to enjoy it. It's a very abrasive book. It's very brash, uh, not to give a review of it here, but uh, you know, if you do like that type of style, it's uh, there's un unlike anything else. It is like 84 pages. It's basically a graphic novel. It's a complete story. Each issue is going to be its own thing. So you can pick up any issue at any time. If your local store does not have it, you can order it directly from Fanagraphics. At least you could have uh, at the time of this video that may have changed, but they're pretty good at restocking things or when it's eventually, eventually released on trade. Or as I mentioned, you can also already get it on digital if you if you so choose. 
Now that we talked about new number ones, let's move over to the world of ongoing series starting new arcs. And there actually are not a lot this week, just a, a few books that are finally coming back, uh, starting with We Only Find Them When They're Dead, number six. This is back from my ADS, is now hitting the shelves once again. And I will say this is a book I dropped off of. I, it just was not clicking with me. It's an interesting premise. I think there's a lot of people who did love it. It was written by Al Ewing. And of course, of Immortal Hulk fame about, you know, this space exploration with people and trying to find these ancient gods and they're always dead and they mine them for different resources and they're trying to find one that's alive. Now with this issue, it does flash forward many years into the future. So I am somewhat interested in going back and just trying to jump on board and seeing maybe if it worked for me now, you know, it, it, even though I have kind of, I stopped at issue three or four, so I might be a little bit lost, but seeing it take place in the future, Let's see what happens. But if you have been enjoying this book and you've been wondering where it is or if it's coming back, uh, do know that this issue is out. The first volume is available. So if it is something that you're at all interested in, the first volume came out a few weeks ago. So if you want to read that and you enjoy it and you want to continue it, issue six will be out this week. Also coming out this week is Still Warden number seven. But yes, this book is finally coming back. It's It's been a while since this hit shelves. This, of course, is written by Chip Zdarsky. This is a story about a town where, where no one dies. The book started off with uh, focusing on this one character that went back home. And now it's kind of expanded out even further. The last few issues dealt with a, a town meeting where there was explosion. And there's a lot of like internal politics that are happening regarding should this town expose itself and making people aware of it exists, like what exactly should happen. And it's kind of been driving a lot of people in different directions. And the way the last book ended, it seems like, you know, things are getting relatively violent in this uh, Stillwater town. Uh, will this be a good starting point for someone who's ever read the book before? My guess is probably not, but the first volume is out. So if you want to check it out. Also, if your person has been following this series. Sometimes it's, it's hard to remember when books are coming back. So I just wanted to point it out. So if you're interested and you want to continue, know you'll get a new issue this week. The last ongoing book starting a new arc this week is Star Wars Bounty Hunters number 12. And this is tying into the Bounty Hunters uh, storyline, the new crossover that is kind of already began and is going to be going into like October. I enjoyed the first issue, the, the alpha that came out a few weeks ago in large part due to Steve McNiffin's art. I am extremely apprehensive, wondering how well this is going to be able to hold itself up. And it's all about, you know, trying to find Carbonite Frozen Han. It's just, it's a it's a long journey uh, to go on for a story where we know how it ends. But if it can keep up the energy in the, in the style of the first issue, maybe that'll be the case. And I do wonder, like, how much is it really going to be impacting these books? Because this series, this first issue seems to be dealing with other side plots outside of just that. So this may not be like extremely welcoming to new readers. The last issue I, I did do a review on was part of my countdown and I and did like it trying to survive off, trying to kill him. Uh, so that was a cool little one shot. And now it's getting into the main storyline of this gigantic uh, crossover. So I don't know. I would say enter at your own risk. If you have been following the, this Bounty Hunter storyline and want to get every issue, you know that this is, will be the issue coming out this week. And then, you know, let me know what you think of it. Like I said, I, I, I'm going to I'm gonna try it at least to start off with, and we'll see how it goes from there. Now that we talked about ongoing series starting new arcs, let's move over to the world of trade paperbacks and graphic novels, starting with We Hereby Refuse, Japanese Americans' refusal to wartime incarceration. And this is, of course, about, you know, the wartime incarceration that occurred to Japanese Americans during World War II, where they're putting to, to basically concentration camps and held there due to American fears of them kind of turning on them during this time. Um, and I'm really interested in seeing how it approaches this. You know, I read the uh, They Called Me Enemy book by George Takai a few years ago, and that was a remarkable book. And it was really eye-opening, not only to uh, George Takai's life, but just that invent in general, because again, it's one of those things that we kind of talk about existing, but we don't necessarily go into the, the finer details all that much. And getting a first hand account of that was impactful. And this, this graphic novel we hereby refuse is about those that refuse to go down that journey. And it's separated to three separate stories uh, by, and is a combination of different creators and artists. I'm excited about this in large part because I do love graphic novels that focus on history in some important way. And of course, this is that. And, you know, I've read about the, the camps that existed, but I've not necessarily 
heard a lot about those that refused to go and the acts that they went through. So getting three separate stories about different individuals that you know have really not been talked about nearly enough in a comic book format, again, to me, just shows the importance of comics, how it can shine a light on a lot of things outside of the fact that we're going to get 8,000 Batman books. We'll also get books like this that also play a very key role to the evolution of the comic book medium. On the omnibus format, we have Superman by Peter, Peter T. Jamasi and Patrick Gleason coming out this week. And this is, you know, focused on the Superman Rebirth run uh, that established itself a few years ago. And actually, I really love this run, at least the majority of it. It it was one of the best Superman stories we've got in some time. It's really what established the relationship between Jonathan Kent and Clark Kent, and like seeing him in this role as a dad. And, and, and how that evolved. It, I, I really missed this series. I've not read it in some time. It was during a time when I was really getting into comics again at, at a high level. And this to me was a, a, one of the best rebirth books. And I know a lot of people had issues because this ended when Bendis came in. Although I feel like near the end of the run, after the first year and a half, two years, it was running a little thin. So that's why I'm not necessarily super interested in the entire run because I didn't have the same admiration for the end as I did the beginning. But maybe if I went back and reread it all over again, I will uh, I'll change my mind. Plus, it also, again, does look fantastic because it has art by Patrick Gleason. But if you did love this run, because I know a lot of people did, or at least a lot of people said they did when they heard Bendis was taking it over and uh, were angry that they were ruining one of the best Superman runs of all time or whatever, as people tend to be when things happen. Uh, but now it's an omnibus format and I'll be hitting shelves this week. Out this week from Scout Comics is Sengi and Tempo trade paperback. And this is uh, part of the Scout Comics Scoot line. And I actually read the first issue of this series of, I don't even know, a few months ago. And I liked it. And what they Scout Comics does, especially for their Scoot line, is that they release the first issue. So you get a little taste. It's like $2.99. So it's a little bit cheaper. But they don't release issue number two. They'll wait for you to buy the entire graphic novel. So I am interested in now reading the entire story. It is more kid-based. It's about this elven and mouse in Africa that start a friendship. So your classic folktale, fairy tale type of storyline. And I thought the first issue, despite the fact that it was like a, you know, a, a smaller issue, a part of a bigger graphic novel uh, gave me a good sense of the characters the conflict and it was like an extended preview in a way uh, and the artwork's pretty solid as well so if you're also interested in, in a book that's more kid friendly and there's not a lot this week i was able to find but this is one of the better examples of them so again it's, it's a trade paperback if you're interested in maybe trying it out like i did again you can try issue number one for a little bit of a price and, not, and get, get an idea of what it's like and if you want to try more now you'll be able to get the entire trade paperback this week. Also coming out this week is Aliens Omnibus, the early years from Marvel, and now that they have this huge catalog of Aliens comics they now own due to Disney buying up everything, they're now releasing it in different formats. Now, uh, in the, getting a bunch of the early years, putting it in, 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 in one collection. So if you're a huge Aliens fan, if you, you know, enjoy those books, I will say Minutia Mint Minute uh, YouTube channel has been going through and did a great video on some of the early year Alien comics. Uh, so if you don't want to spend all the money on one omnibus but want to read some of the earlier comics, I found that very helpful. I've not read a lot of Alien content, mostly the stuff that's come out in the last five to six years. I really loved the book that was done by James Stokoe a few years ago, Alien Dead Orbit, I believe. And it kind of was in the same vein as classic Alien, where you have people on a space station trying to avoid this one alien. And with James Stokoe's art, which is always great to look at. As I mentioned, my news for a minute did a really good insightful video a few weeks ago about a lot of the early Aliens comics when it was released by Dark Horse. So if you want a more intense guide about what books existed, what books you can pick up. Maybe you don't want to spend all the money on Omnibus. You, you can check that out. But if you are interested or you maybe just like everything in one complete package and you, you love Omnibuses, you'll be able to get this book this upcoming Wednesday. Also coming out this week from Image Comics is Home Six Pilots. Uh, this is written by... Dan Walters with art by Casper Wingard. And this is a book that I had high, high hopes for. I know a lot of people really did like this series. It just did not click with me per se. It, it's a different take on the haunted house genre. I actually found myself enjoying the general like drama bits about like 
them in school and also different takes on things like punk rock and fun bits like that where the the supernatural element i, I don't know it didn't necessarily have the impact that i want i'm a huge fan of dan walters as a writer i like a lot of the stuff he does but sometimes things don't work for you and that was the case with this book but maybe if i read it in one complete setting i'll, I'll change my mind i do know a lot of people did love it if you do love the horror genre you can now check it out. It's not over. This is just the first volume. Uh, new issues are scheduled to come, be coming out soon. So if you wanted to be able to kind of read it and see if you do like it before those new issues are released, you can check out the first volume now this Wednesday. Last trade paperback I'm going to talk about this week is Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy. This is from the 2019-2020 series from Jordi Hauser and art by Adrian Mello. And this is a book I completely miss, to be honest with you. Harley Quinn is one of those characters I can te technically take or leave. I actually do really love the HBO Max series. I didn't think I would like it. I didn't love the first episode. It felt a little bit too brash to be brash. Like, hey, look, we're cursing. But as things went on, I ended up loving it. Ron Funches is King Shark forever. Uh, but with this series, I know the, the combination of Poison Ivy and, and Harley Quinn tends to lead to really great things like with the TV show. So maybe I'll go back and give it a shot. Like I've not read it. I do like a lot of Jody Houser's past works. So that has me excited. The art does look pretty well. I don't know the artist all that much, but obviously they're huge fans of both of these characters, especially when they're together. And I get why even way back when the, they first really partnered up in the Batman animated series many eons ago, it, it worked. And They've been utilizing that partnership ever since. So if you're a huge fan of the series, I'd be interested in hearing it. I feel like I've heard nothing about it for some reason. And I guess there are a lot of comics so that's bound to happen. So that's why I also wanted to pick it up and let people know about it. Because if you missed out on it like I did, you know it'll be coming out this week. All right. So we talked about ongoing series starting new arcs, notable number ones, tree paperbacks, and graphic novels. Now it's time to talk about the thing I'm most excited about, my pick of the week. All right, when it came to this week, like I said, there are a lot of books I could have chosen. I almost went with Wonder Girl. I almost went with a Mortal Hulk one shot. But when I looked at everything, the book I'm most excited about is Fantastic Four Life Story number one. And why is that? A number of reasons. I did really like Spider-Man Life Story. I thought it took an idea that of superheroes aging and it did fun stuff with it. Inter interesting stuff. And taking the idea of aging heroes and utilizing that to also touch upon classic storylines also incorporating things like historical events like Vietnam, seeing this entire thing play out, almost like an extended what if issue. And now we're getting that with Fantastic Four. And I think it actually makes a lot of sense, especially being kind of the the, the team that helped relaunch what Marvel is now um, back in the 60s. And now how is that going to tie into, you know, I'm guessing the space race, other key elements. There's always the, a lot of drama within the Fantastic Four. And it did seem like when you were reading Spider-Man Life Story that they were also creating like an entire new universe because it, it, it had spinoffs with Iron Man and Captain America. And my guess is this will be something the same. Also, this is written by Mark Russell, who is one of my favorite writers right now. Anytime his name is on a book, I'm going to check it out. And putting that idea of him writing Fantastic Four, tying it to historical events, letting him the freedom to kind of not have to worry about anything like continuity. And, you know, having him take on a team like this, there's a lot of potential there. He's written some Marvel book, the book he did for Captain America, the snapshot uh, last year, I thought was great. It was a great uh, kind of offshoot of that character. And now we're seeing him take on another main Marvel character. Mostly he's done DC work and stuff for Dynamite and, and uh, Ahoy. I'm I'm all more excited to see him take on bigger and more notable characters like the Fantastic Four. So the artists I don't have a lot of experience with, though I don't necessarily can speak to that. I did look at the preview pages. Those look, they look pretty good. They look solid. Not nothing something that's going to make me super excited about the book. But all the other elements that I talked about is really why I'm most excited about it. Really, when I heard this was going to be a thing, I'm like, okay, I know what I'm doing. My starting points video. That's going to be the most excited book of the week, most likely. And that was the case. And of course, here we are talking about it now. But I'm excited for comics this week. There's a lot, a lot of you looking out for outside of new series and ongoing series. So if you're curious to hear more of my thoughts about it, I'll be doing my top 10. I try to release that around Saturdays or Sundays. So you can check that out. You can check out my last top 10 that came out a few days ago. Uh, but I do want to thank you for taking the time to check out my video. I appreciate that. And just remember, comics are for everyone. The key is finding the right one. Until next time, keep reading.